Right, Welcome to the last session on the last day of Southwest Fox 2003. And since this is the last session, I think it's the right time to give a big thank you to the three folks that made this possible, Rick, Doug, and Tamar. Uh, great to be back together again. And for all of you who are virtually, it's nice to see you here. This session is entitled Collaboration Made Easy Using Git with Teams. Uh, we're not going to dig into the internals of Git. I've spoken on that several times, but uh, we assume you have at least a basic working knowledge of Git, and we're going to be focusing on how we use Git with Teams. My name is Rick Borup. Um, after a career in the IT area of corporate banking, uh, I formed my own company in 1993 when I got excited about Foxpro, and I've been working with it uh, since then, like many of you, since about 30 years ago now. And I worked primarily in Fox Pro and SQL Server. Um, back when certification was a thing, I picked up a couple of uh, certifications from Microsoft, which I was very happy to be able to do. And I had the pleasure of working with some smart folks on a couple of books. Uh, it's hard to believe those have been going on 20 years ago now, but uh, I think they still stand the test of time. So that's enough about me. This is what we're going to explore today. Uh, we'll talk about, first of all, if you're going to use Git in a team environment, you need a place to put it. So I'm going to talk about hosting platforms in a general sense and how to get started using a hosting platform. And those two topics will be uh, one after the other in the presentation. The next four topics I'm going to blend together in the form of examples. So we're going to talk about how and when to create local branches and how many branches we should be using. I shouldn't say should, how many we can. There are so many different workflows that each one uh, is unique. And we'll talk about that as we get there too. We'll talk about using pull requests uh, to share code between developers. Uh, I'll have a brief uh, sidebar discussion into a tool that uh, can be used to help track issues, a project management tool. And then throughout all of it, I'm going to be using source tree, which is a Git GUI from Atlassian as the basis for all of the work that we're going to be doing. Remote attendees, I think you all know this by now, please use the chat window. There is a Q&A session afterwards, so please join that. Uh, In-person attendees, I've peppered the slides with a couple of places for questions. Uh, when you see that question mark guy pop up, that'll be the time to ask a question. Whether or not we have time to take any questions at that point will depend on how the flow of the and the timing of the session is going. So if I don't get to you or if I cut it short, uh, please understand and I'll get the questions at the end if I don't get to them during. So let's talk about Git hosting platforms. I'm going to talk about three of them in general. They're not the only three. They're, in my estimation, probably the three most well known. I'm not presenting them in any particular order. This is alphabetical. So I'm trying not to favor one over the other. But I want to mention Bitbucket from Atlassian, GitHub, now a Microsoft offering, and GitLab. Uh, again, the three that I'm uh, most aware of and most familiar with. All three of these, it turns out, offer three different types of accounts. They may call them different things. All three have a free offering, which is great if you want to experiment. Or if you're an individual developer, that may be all you need, even if you want to use a remote. Uh, in Bitbucket's case, they then have a standard and a premium. One of the things you're going to want to look for is whether or not your hosting platform offers public and private repositories. And if so, are there restrictions on the number of repositories under the various plans? Uh, in an open source environment, you're typically going to want to use uh, a public repository. After all, that's kind of the point. But if you're working on uh, proprietary software in a corporate environment, most likely you're going to want to have a private repository and you're going to want to control access uh, to that repository for authorized developers only. So in each of these next couple of slides, I put the link at the bottom. And of course, all of this is in the white paper as well, where you can get full information directly from the source. GitHub was formed in 2008 as an independent uh, hosting service was acquired by Microsoft in 2018, uh, caused a little bit of concern among the open source development community because at that time Microsoft was just starting to get into open source. But I think it's fair to say they've uh, really got on board with GitHub and have worked to improve and 
support it all along, and it continues to be uh, a very widely used and extremely viable product. It offers unlimited public and private repositories, and you can get information uh, at the github.com slash pricing page. Again, three offerings, free team and enterprise is how they call them. A uh, little sidebar here, uh, GitHub is not the same as Git. Just because you have Git doesn't mean you have GitHub, even though the word Git appears in both names. And conversely, GitHub is not Git. So Git is the version control software. GitHub is the hosting service. Finally, I wanted to mention GitLab, also three types of accounts called free, premium, and ultimate. I don't use GitLab. I can't speak from experience. But when I was researching it, I found the statement that if there's a five user limit for quote unquote a top level group with private visibility, which I take to mean private repositories. Um, and so those are the kinds of things you want to look for when you're deciding not only on the platform, but also on what tier, or what type of account you want to select. Uh, GitLab is a little unique. It has a self hosting option. However, it does not run on Windows. So if you're interested in self hosting on your own equipment and your own server, that'll need to be Linux or Mac OS. And here's the uh, link there at the bottom of the slide. So getting started, of course, is very straightforward. You simply set up an account. You create a new repository. Whichever one of these you're using will provide the instructions. You're going to be doing this through a browser. You'll give your repository a name. You'll decide if it's public or private. In the ones I'm familiar with, you may get a prompt to automatically create a .git ignore file and or a readme file. Uh, one tip I could offer is that if you are going to be uploading an existing Git repository and you have your own Git ignore file, don't let it create one. That'll just cause a modified file condition when you upload your own. So tell it not to and then just include your own when you upload the content for the first time. After that, it's simply a matter of getting your existing content up to the remote repository on the hosting service. You can either create one from scratch and start with a blank repository and just create content as you go along. Uh, probably you are going to have one that already exists on your local machine, in which case you can push it up to the remote. Uh, and the commands for doing that are typically uh, stated on the web page when you go through that process. Uh, usually git push, uh, git remote, which adds the remote to your local, and then git push, creating an upstream link. Uh, using the origin, which is the standard name for the upstream remote and the main branch. Important to note that all content initially starts on the main branch. Main used to be called the master branch in Git. So when I say main branch here, I'm talking not only generically, but also the branch that is now most commonly called main, um, capital M if you want. And finally, you're going to want to add team members. You want to decide who can access the remote assuming that it's a private repository and uh, who can do things like push, who can approve pull requests and so on. That is about all it takes to get going on these things other than each individual person, each individual developer needs to establish their credentials for connecting to the remote. And that's typically done either with secure shell or with secure HTTP. If you're working through a browser, most likely it's going to be HTTP. Uh, if you prefer to interact with the remote from the command line, you'll need to set up the public and private key pair for SSH. Uh, that's not a difficult process. There's a link in the white paper about a couple of uh, things to know about when you're doing that. So that's all it takes to get going. I'd like to talk about workflows now because a lot of what we're going to be doing today is going to be dealing with how we use the remote in connection with our local repositories. So a quick introduction to workflows generally can be categorized into three or into four or five different areas. Centralized, the feature branch workflow model, Gitflow, which is kind of its own thing, uh, the forking workflow, which involves creating forks, and I'll talk about each of these in detail in just a moment. And then there are also other variations, uh, typically based on some of the four that we've just mentioned. So let's take these in order and talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each one. The centralized workflow is unique in that all commits are made on the main branch. So there's a main branch on the remote. And when a developer is ready to uh, share changes or have them integrated into the production code, 
they push to the main branch. It does not use pull requests. So its advantage is that it's simple. It's about as simple as it can possibly get. The disadvantages, in my view, are that it, first of all, doesn't leverage the power of Git branching and merging, which, after all, is kind of what Git's strength is. Uh, and the other disadvantage is the timing of when you know about conflicts. When you're pushing to main, let me back up just a quick step. You pull from main. You do some work on your local. And you're ready to push those changes back up to main on the remote. When you do that, you may find that your push is rejected. If development has diverged, in other words, if somebody else also pulled main and did some work and pushed ahead of your push, then your main is no longer current. And that push will be rejected. You won't know about it until it comes time to push. So in a disadvantage in the sense of not detecting conflicts until sort of the last minute. And then you'll have to resolve the conflict and redo the, uh, redo the push. In the feature branch workflow, which is a really sort of a broad category, all development takes place on the local machine on a branch. And we'll go through examples of all of this. The local branch then is pushed to the remote at least once, but possibly more than once. It can be done as a backup uh, even before you're ready to create a pull request. And this workflow does use pull requests to share changes. Its advantages are that it separates work in progress from production. That's a good thing. We don't want any experimental code getting into our production code, particularly if we're building releases off of the production code. It also facilitates code reviews. It makes it possible by the shared nature of the remote repository for other developers on the team to take a look at changes that developer A has made, developer B can take a look at it and uh, approve or comment or contribute to it. So it really facilitates the collaborative nature of using the remote. Um, that third bullet point, main branch is always, quote, bug free. Has anybody ever seen bug free code? I have oh, yeah. never seen. So I had limited space on the slide. What I mean to say is that the production, uh, the main branch is always free from known bugs. I couldn't quite fit that on the slide, but that's a better way to put it. The main branch is free from known bugs. The disadvantages are that it's slightly more complex than the centralized workflow because it involves branches. And it also means that somebody could be the developer, could be a project manager, whoever has to uh, approve and merge the pull requests. Gitflow is its own animal. Uh, it was developed uh, by the, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Vincent Weissen, perhaps. Uh, there's the link that's been out there for quite a while. Reason, I guess it would be. Um, and if you're interested in that workflow, you can go to that link and you'll find quite an interesting diagram there. The advantage of that workflow is that uh, it is a disciplined approach. And so it, it involves several branches and has a very formalized approach to how they're used. The disadvantages, if any, are that it is more complex than some of the other workflows. The formality, in my view, could be a little cumbersome and it involves more than one long-lived branch. I'll talk a little later about the difference between long-lived and short-lived branches. So that's Gitflow. Uh, a forking workflow is different in nature than all of the others. In a forking workflow, each developer has their own repository on the remote. And work begins by creating a fork, which starts out as a copy of the central repository. And then the developer clones the fork to their local machine does all the work on the local machine, same local workflow as whatever they're using, and pushes to the fork rather than to the central repository. And finally, when it's time to create a pull request, the source of the pull request is the fork rather than being a branch on the central repository. So there's the, the difference in nature. Uh, one advantage, if you want to look at it that way, is that it protects the central repository, only the maintainer or maintainers can do anything on the central repository. Nobody else can push to it. Um, disadvantages, the overhead of having uh, every developer needs to have their own account. You have the overhead of having more than one remote. Um, is anybody using a forking workflow here? Okay, and working for you? A couple of hands went up uh, in that. 
it's probably an overstatement to say there are as many workflows as there are teams. Most of them, in my experience, are based on some variation of the feature branch workflow. It's important to point out there is, in my opinion, no best workflow. Best is whatever works for you and for your team. And when we start discussing workflows, the conversation can kind of get involved with this. You know, anybody remember the old kennel ration commercials? My dog's better than your dog. Well, that's, you know, my workflow is better than your workflow because, because this, because that. Well, I really don't want to get into that discussion here. We could spend all day here discussing different workflows and why one is better than another. And the workflow that I'm going to use in the illustrations in this session is a workflow, not a best workflow, no better than, no worse than any others. It's the one that works best for what I'm talking about here today. If I were asked for any suggestions about workflows, I would say keep it simple and use the minimum number of branches necessary to get the job done. The more branches, the more complexity, the more complexity, the more potential for error. And, you know, you don't want to have the overhead of using the remote workflow become a task in itself. You want it to be as seamless as possible. Sometimes the question comes up, and this relates not only to the remote, of course, but to just your local workflow. When and how often do you make commits? So there was a nice analogy, and a shout out to John Wells for uh, providing this analogy, to think of commits as stepping stones and to think of pull requests as milestones. So you use as many commits as you feel is necessary to get to that milestone, the pull request. And there's some wiggle room in there. How granular do you want to be? Do you want to commit every file that you change individually? Do you want to commit a group of files because all the changes relate to a single feature? That's up to you. But in any case, I just thought this was a nice analogy and wanted to offer it here. Uh, commits as stepping stones and pull requests as milestones. So I'll take questions for just a minute here if there are any. I see none in the room, none online, none online so we'll go on. And now I want to talk about source tree for a little bit. Grab a little drink of water here. Source tree is a graphical user interface from Atlassian, the same company that offers Bitbucket. And rather than showing source tree interactively, partly because the demo gods are not always smiling, and partly because when it comes to working with remotes, the internet gods are not always smiling. I'm going to do all of this with slides. I know slides can be tedious, so I ask for your patience and your indulgence. I've tried to animate the slides as much as possible, so as you watch them, I hope you get a sense of what the flow would look like if you're actually, if I were actually using Source Tree interactively here. So I'm going to give you a quick intro to Source Tree, and then we'll see it again later on uh, as we go through the session examples. So first of all, Source Tree is a free product. You can download it from sourcetreeapp.com. Uh, it's available for both Windows and for Mac. And actually, the web page detects what you're using when you go to it, and it'll offer the download for the appropriate one. Or you can get it from the link there at the bottom if you're looking for the other one. So first of all, Source Tree is a multiple document interface. It has tabs. Uh, in this case, I have three tabs open. The, the team that I'm going to be using for an example has three developers, Alice, Bob, and Rick. So in Source Tree, you can have more than one repository open. Uh, because I'm simulating a team here, I've got them all on my local machine. Obviously, the ones that you open are all on your local machine. Source Tree offers a bookmarks feature, which can be handy if you've got lots of local repositories and you move between them. Uh, in this case, I've created a group of bookmarks. Uh, so it has that subfolder feature for this conference uh, with the three local repositories that I'll be using in examples. On the left is the panel that determines what you see on the right. And in all of these cases, uh, if the important stuff is near the bottom or is too small, I'll try to remember to magnify the screen. So if I forget to do that or if you're having trouble seeing it, uh, please raise a hand and ask me to remember to magnify the screen. What I wanted to point out here was the, Does that help? Yeah. Okay. So we 
one of the panels that you'll work with a lot is the branches panel and it will list all of the branches that exist in the local repository. In this case, there's only one to begin with, the main branch, and the one that is currently checked out will always be in bold. That's not obvious here because it's the only one, but later on when we see several of them, uh, that will become more apparent. So this is the main branch, and because we're in the history view, and I'll get to that in a second, we're looking at the history in the right side. So we're seeing the graphical history of this uh, this repository, which currently has only three commits for it. One of the other choices in the workspace is the file status. I know it's hard to read that because it's uh, shaded, but uh, that's called file status, and that changes what you see on the right. Right now we're showing the pending files, and if the repository is clean, meaning there are no modified files, it'll tell you there's nothing to commit. So that's kind of a blank screen. There is a drop-down menu over to the right of that red box area, which allows you to control what you see in the list. So if you choose pending files, you're going to see commit or modified files that are not yet committed. One of the other choices that's really useful, and I'll illustrate that in a minute, is the all files choice. So we'll get down to that. You also have choices for how you want the list to be sorted. If there are modified files, then in Git, they, they start out as unstaged. In source tree, those files appear in the lower portion of that central panel. Again, I can magnify a little bit, and you can see those there. And if you select one of them, then you will see a diff of the changes in that file presented off to the right. So that's kind of a nice way of quickly looking at what's different. At the top, you may notice the commit button has a three superimpose on it. That tells you at a quick glance that there are three unstaged files. When the files get staged, they jump up to the upper portion of that central panel by clicking either stage all or stage selected. And then at this point, you're getting ready to commit. You can still see the diff just by selecting one of the files uh, in the stage files area. And when you're ready to commit, and here I'll zoom in on this so we can see it a little better because it's at the bottom of the slide. You have a space to write your commit message and you have a button to click commit and that's what it that's how the process is completed. So that would be equivalent to doing the git commit command from the command line. So we click commit and the commit happens. I wanted to point out what you can do with the all files choice on that drop down menu. One of the things that you might typically run into when working in any Git repository is to know you want to know when did a file change. And you do that from the command line with the git log command. In source tree, you can also do it interactively with the right click menu. The challenge is finding that file. And you can one way to do it is to search through the commit history graphically and find a commit that changed that file, but that can be almost impossible in a long history. So another way is to select all files, in which case you can select one. In this case, it's a, a Fox bin to PRG copy of a form. You can right click and say log selected. And what you get is a form that shows you in reverse chronological with the newest at the top, all of the commits in which that file was changed. And as always, you can select the file and see the diff on the right hand side. So that's an extremely useful uh, feature in source tree. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong thing there. The other view is the search view. Oh, gosh, what happened? Okay. What I did is I hit the escape key to get out of the magnifier, and that was the wrong thing to do. So we should be good to go now. And we're waiting, for those of you on virtual, we're waiting for the screen to come back in the room, and I think we're good now. Back in business, apologies. 
So the search view allows you to search the repository in one of three different ways, uh, either by command, message, file changes, or authors. So that's helpful in a large repository when you want to find a particular commit or a reference to a particular change that you're looking for. Any questions about source tree at this point? And we will see source tree again by way of example. No hands in the room, nothing online. Okay, great, let's keep going. So for the purpose of illustration, we created a sample project here. It doesn't matter at all what the project is. Uh, we have a development team, uh, three developers, Alice, Bob, and Rick. Kind of looks like Bob's picture is upside down, but it's just that his hair kind of migrated. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so it's not really upside down. Uh, so that's our development team. And this team has made some decisions about how they're going to approach this project. They're going to host on Bitbucket. They are going to use source tree as the GUI for Git. Uh, they're going to use a modified or very simple feature branch workflow. They will use pull requests to share changes via the remote. And they're going to use a tool called Jira from Atlassian uh, to track issues and to track work in progress. Uh, and th that's a nice tool that's integrated with Bitbucket uh, because they're both from Atlassian. Other hosting providers would have similar tools for project management. So the first step for all three of the developers is to make a local clone of the repository. Never mind how it got to the remote in the first place, that's irrelevant. Uh, the link is at the top for this particular one just to show you what it looks like, but you don't actually type that into your uh, navigation bar in your browser. What you do is you sign into the remote, you select that repository, and you click on it, and then you get an option to clone it. So that's the uh, mouse click button in the upper right-hand corner there. And when you do that, uh, you get a dialog that gives you the command to accomplish the clone. So you can do this from the command line. And by the way, you have a choice of either HTTPS or SSH at this point. And if you choose the other, you'll get a slightly different command in the command window. But if you're using source tree, you can clone directly from source tree, which is a really cool feature. So all you have to do is click the clone in source tree button, presuming source tree is already installed on your machine. And now we're in source tree and you get this dialogue with a new tab. It's gonna create a new tab in that multiple document interface, reflecting the source of the clone and confirming that it's a Git repository. Uh, prompting you with a default location to put it on your local machine. You can change that. And then all you have to do is click the clone button and it accomplishes the clone. You'll see some activity happening in the command window. And finally, this is what you get. So here we are back in familiar territory in source tree with a clone copy now on the local machine. In this case, this is Rick's machine. And we see that repository with uh, three commits having been made and we're ready to go to work. If you want to check that the upstream link exists to the remote, you can click on the menu at the very top where it says repository and choose repository settings. This is what's displayed and you can confirm that you have an upstream link to a repository named origin and there is the uh, secure HTTP link, which is the way we're accessing it here in this example. So that isn't anything you need to do anything about, but you can add remotes from this dialogue if you're working with more than one remote. So a little side trip into JIRA here. JIRA is a very uh, powerful and, and multi-featured product. I'm looking at a very, very small piece of it here. There are multiple views. There's a timeline view and there's a Kanban view. And this is the one I'm showing here. This is your typical to do, doing, done type of uh, workflow management tool. In this case, uh, we've chosen to have a fourth column for on hold. But the nice thing about this is you create tasks, you assign them to developers, and then you can track progress as you go along uh, using the JIRA tool. JIRA is also able to filter the list of tasks, which is useful when there's dozens or hundreds of them. You can search for a task name or you can uh, search by who they're assigned to. So Rick goes into JIRA and takes a look. If he doesn't already know that he's been assigned one task, he moves it over to in progress. And the project manager has determined that the other four tasks, which are assigned to Alice and Bob, can't happen until Rick's job is done because they, the other 
developers can't run the executable until the change that Rick has been assigned has been made. So they're moved on hold, uh, and Rick's is in progress at this point, and he starts to work on it. So Rick's ready to go to work. The only thing that he hasn't figured out yet, it hasn't been discussed here yet, is what branching strategy on the remote and on the local is this team going to use? Remember, I said it was going to be a, a simple, modified feature branch type workflow. So let's take a look at what some of the options are in two categories, on the remote and then on the local. You have to make decisions about what to use. So in this workflow, the main branch is going to be production code. The main branch in any repository is always a long-lived branch. Long-lived in this case means permanent. If the main branch goes away, the project goes away. So it's always there. Other branches on the remote will exist when they're pushed by developers. Those are going to be short-lived branches. Now, short-lived can be today. It could be days. It could even be weeks. It depends on how long the process takes. But they're not intended to be permanent. In some workflows, not in this one that I'm going to discuss, there might be a release branch. There might be a testing branch uh, on the remote. But again, the more branches there are, the more complex the whole process gets. So in this particular one, we're only going to be using the main branch on the remote and then temporary or short-lived um, developer branches. Similarly, on the local machines, and this is where each developer then individually, there will be a main branch that has production code, also a long-lived branch. Other branches will be created by the developers as short-lived branches, typically one for each feature that they work on. And by the way, I'm going to use the term feature and issue interchangeably. Feature kind of implies something new, and issue kind of implies a fix. But really, it's the same thing. It's a change to some code and a commit. So let me use those two terms interchangeably. There's many different ways to handle local branches. I see I've misspelled it on the slide. That's what I get for making a change 10 minutes ago. Uh, but in all cases, this workflow follows rule number one, which is the main branch has the production code on both the local and the remote machines. That's important. Here's a corollary. The main branch has only the production code on both the local and the remote machine. That'll be important later on when we see how this workflow is a little different from some other workflows. So keep rule number one in mind. I like to think of the development process as a cycle. Beginning at the 4 o'clock position, developer starts by checking out main from the remote. So we're up to date with the most recent changes. Uh, creates a branch, does the coding and testing, makes commits along the way. Those uh, two steps can be repeated as many times as necessary. And at some point, you get to where you're ready to push to the remote. Now, again, you might push a branch to the remote just to create a backup. Uh, or you might be ready to create the pull request already. In any case, when you are ready to create the pull request, then the cycle begins on the remote. Uh, the new branch exists. The pull request is created. It's reviewed. The code is reviewed. Once it's approved, then it's merged back into main. And at that point, the developer pulls main back into the local repository, and the cycle starts all over again. So I look at it kind of as a figure eight. Uh, and meshing gears, if you will, this whole process continues uh, on as long as the project is under development. A couple of different ways that local branches evolve on the, on the local repository. I think of them as parallel and serial. Those are just terms that I kind of use when I'm thinking about it. I'm not sure I've ever seen them in the literature. But um, the process, as outlined here on this slide, is you check out main, you pull from the remote, you create a branch for the issue or the feature you're working on, you make commits. At some point, you push the feature. You create a pull request, and you go back to step one. And step one starts with checking out from main. So graphically, it kind of looks like this. If you're working on three features, each of them would start from the main branch, and you would end up with what I call parallel branches. None of the changes in feature two are in feature one, unless they got back to main ahead of time. And none of the changes in feature three are in feature two or one. So they're parallel, if you will accept that view of things. The other way is where sometimes you get into a situation that you are ready to start work on a new issue, but it depends on the previous changes you've made. 
but those changes are not yet in main. So again, this is a little bit unique to this workflow. Here's what happens. You work on feature one, you push it, it's ready to go, but while it's in testing, let's say, there's a delay now before it gets back into main on the remote, you're ready to go to work on feature two. But feature two builds on top of, or relies on, or depends on code that you changed in feature one. So if you go back to the main branch and create another branch off main, you're not going to have those feature one changes. And yet you need them to work on feature two. So the one way around that is to create a branch off feature one. And that looks like this. And that's why I call it serial branching. Feature 2A branched off of feature 2. Feature 4 branched off of feature 3. So now you have branches coming off of other branches. That's why I call them serial branching. So I hope that's uh, at least a little bit clear. Everybody's workflow is going to be different whether you get into this situation or not. It depends on a lot of factors, but uh, I have encountered it in my own work. One of the questions that comes up when you have a lot of branches is, where did that branch begin? And it's not always easy to tell. If you look at the graph, the graphical history on this slide, branch three is selected, but it's not immediately obvious where it started. This is such a simple example I just cooked up for this slide that you could pretty easily just follow down uh, the lines that represent the graphical uh, history in this repository and find out where it started. In a long history, that's either not easy or virtually impossible. Similarly, if you look at the list of branches in source tree, it's just a list. There's no hierarchy there. So you don't know by looking at the list that 2A came off of 2 or that 4 came off of 3. So what do you do? Well, get to the rescue. Git maintains something called the reference log. The reference log is a list of every time the head changed on a branch. And there is a way to query the reference log. It's called reflog. And the command is git reflog followed by the branch name. So it's very straightforward. And what you get is something like this. Let me bring that up a little bit bigger for you. So in this case, uh, we're asking for the reference log for a test a branch called my test branch. And Git responds with a list of all of the places where my test branch changed. And the last one on the list is where it started. So from this, it's easy to see. And actually, the highlight is provided by Git in the command line that the branch was created from my branch. I think the highlighting is part of the command. I'm not sure. Anyway, so that's a great way to do it. Now, it would be nice if this was in source tree, but it is not currently. And in looking at the support forums, I found references where folks have requested this more than once over the years. And uh, I don't know that it's ever going to be part of source tree itself, but it sure would be nice if it was. Uh, so we don't have to go out to the command line to get here. Again, a pause for questions. Yes, we have a question. Source tree does have, I think they call it a terminal option where you can easily get to the command line from within source tree. If you, if you run into one of these where you need to type in. The, the question is, is there a quick way to get to the command line? Uh, I, I, there is. From, there is. A, all right. You're saying there I is. I think it's called terminal. Terminal. There's a, one of those icons up there, and it'll pop up a, a window where you can type in git commands and, and immediately get to. Uh, the comment is that there is a an icon in source tree uh, that you can click to open a terminal window, and then you can quickly switch over to anything you need to do in the command line. Uh, that's great to know. I personally uh, always work with the Windows Terminal Core uh, open, and so I just flip over to it if I need to do anything from the command line. But thank you for that comment. That's good to know. Yes, another question? No more. Uh, I recommend most of these commands. Use the best. If you have any problem, with give any help on the best, go to the Linux, not on Windows. So you need to have the Linux command ready. You're recommending using Bash? Yes. Okay. Sure. I'm going to guess that many of us as Windows developers are not super familiar with Bash. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Right. So that was the comment. Thank you for that comment. Are there any other questions in the room or online? Nothing online. Great. Let's keep going. 
So now Rick is ready to get back to work. Now that he understands the branching model that his team has decided to use, he can get back to work. He knows how to branch. He knows how to use source tree to create branches, to make commits, and to push to remote. And we're going to illustrate that as we go along here. So again, uh, please think of this as watching Git in action, even though I'm just animating the slides here. So the first step is to create a branch. That's easily done by clicking on the big branch icon on the toolbar in source tree. And what happens is you get a dialogue that says, what do you want to call that branch? Well, it's customary in some team efforts to name the branch after the task that is being worked on. So in this case, all of the tasks are called demo dash something, one, two, three, four, five. And so it's convenient to call the branch uh, the same as the task. You might add some additional uh, wording after that. Just keep in mind that branch names cannot have spaces, but you can add additional information there if that were uh, helpful. By default, SourceTree is going to check the checkout new branch, which is typically what you want to do. The assumption being that you're going to immediately want to start working on that branch. You click create branch and you get this and I'll go ahead and make that bigger. And now you can see the importance of knowing that the checked out branch is in bold in the list of branches in source tree. Demo one in bold is the currently checked out branch. They're listed alphabetically. Main still exists, but it's not bold, so it's not checked out. That's a visual clue. When you're working with a lot of branches, it can become uh, important to make sure you're on the one you intend to be on before you start doing things. And it's possible to single click on a branch and it'll get the shaded background. And you might think that means that it's checked out, but if it's not in bold, it's not checked out. So double check yourself to know what branch you're working on. So Rick has now created the demo one branch. He's ready to start to work. He does some coding, makes some changes, whatever he was assigned to do, and he's ready to commit. So now there are a bunch of unstaged files, several in this case. So the question at this point is, how granular do we want to be in our commit process? Do we want to commit single files at a time? Do we want to commit all of them because they all related to the same feature? That is a, a team decision, or in some cases, an individual developer decision. In this case, I want to illustrate how you select certain commit or files, but not all of them to stage and commit. So you do that simply by clicking on the files that you want to commit on the bottom panel, and then clicking on stage selected, the other choice being stage all. So you can stage all files in one step or just the ones you've highlighted. And when you do that, they jump up to the top in the staged area. Again, whichever is selected, you can see the diff on the right. And you can confirm that these are the files you want to stage and then commit them. And here again, the important stuff is at the bottom where we enter a commit message and click the commit button. Another custom is to include the task name in the commit message. You'll see why that's helpful later on when we start looking at the history on the remote. So in this case, demo dash one, which is the name of the task, followed by the commit message, uh, following whatever team uh, guidelines there are for making commit messages. And messages, by the way, can have spaces. Branch names can't, but messages certainly can. Messages can be multiple lines if that is necessary as well. So you click the command button, uh, excuse me, the commit button. And the commit takes place. And what source tree does by default is to jump back to the history view. So now we're seeing history with rather than three lines. Now we have five lines. The second from the top line is the commit that was just done. You can see demo one there again, perhaps easier to see it if we make it bigger. So the second from the top line is the commit that was just made. And the fact that it was uh, on the demo one branch uh, is reflected both on the graphical history and also in the commit message. But at the very top, we see that there are still uncommitted changes. 
right there. Because we didn't select all, right? We only selected a portion of the unstaged files. So to me, what I always want to do in this case is to go back to the unstaged file list. I'd rather see the file status than the history. And there is an option in source tree that allows you to do that. This is what I would prefer to see because I'm probably going to go on and commit those files and maybe just keep working on them. But in any case, I want to see them. I don't just want to see uncommitted changes at the top. So here's the option. If you go into source trees, general options, uh, after committing, stay in the commit dialog if there are still pending changes. Mark that choice and uh, then click OK. And then from then on, when you commit, if there are still uncommitted changes, you'll go back to the file status view instead of directly to the history view. So I kind of like that. Uh, again, a personal preference. So Rick finishes up his changes. He does all his commits. And now he's ready to do a pull request. But let me pause here for just a bit and show you some of the uh, information that you get directly from source tree when you're looking at a commit. <coughs> so this needs to be made larger as well. And we'll start at the top. When you select a commit, and you select it by simply single clicking on it, then it gets the shaded background so you know which one you're looking at. And off to the right, you can see the date and the author and the commit ID, the short version of the commit ID. So that's a lot of information right there. And of course, you can also see the, the history. Sorry, wrong button there. But if you look down below, there are, on the left, there are two pieces of information. One panel shows you the full commit ID, the parent ID, the author, the full date and time, and the commit message, which is nice. So if you're inspecting a history, you can select a commit and get all of this information directly visually in source tree. Not only do you see the commit message, but down below that, you see a list of the files that were committed in that commit. Also helpful. And as always, if you select one of them, in this case, the form, myform.sc2, you get the diff on the right. So a lot of information available directly and visually from source tree just by looking at a commit. So Rick's now ready to push his changes. And he does that by clicking the push button on the toolbar. I didn't animate that portion, but it's the third from the left. You click the push button and you get the push dialog, which looks like this. Uh, it says, what branch do you want to push? In this case, there's only two. In this workflow, you never, ever push the main branch up to the remote. So you always are going to push whatever branch you're working on. Uh, the remote branch typically is going to have the same name as the local branch. doesn't have to, but it gets confusing if it doesn't. And the little tick mark on the right where it says track means it's going to create a remote tracking branch on the local repository to track changes on the remote. Uh, and that's checked by default. So when that's ready, you click the push button and it pushes the local branch up to the remote and creates that branch on the remote. So now we switch gear. Now we're no longer in source tree. Now we're in the browser looking at the repository on Bitbucket in this case. Uh, again, there's the link that you see in your browser, but you don't get there by navigating directly to that link. The way you get there is by clicking the branches choice on the menu on the left, and then it opens up the list of branches. In this case, there are two, the main branch, and the one in the red box is the demo one branch that was just created. So where do we go from there? You remember that figure eight cycle that I showed you? Now we're on the right side of that figure eight. We're working on the remote. In order to finish or to create the pull request from that branch, you start by clicking the Create Pull Request button. And that brings up this dialog, which allows you to confirm what's happening before you finalize the pull request. So the first piece of information is what's the source and what's the target or the destination. And we're confirming that the source branch is the demo one branch that's on the remote now. 
and the destination is the main branch because in this workflow we always merge into the main branch further on down the person developer creating the pull request has an opportunity to uh, ask other people to review the product or the code changes before finalizing the pull request before merging the pull request so uh, you can type in the names there and as you begin typing bitbucket will complete them based on who it knows is part of this project so in this case rick is asking both alice and bob to review and approve these changes before they get into production the last little box down there that is uh, in red gives you a choice of deleting the branch after it's merged personally i prefer not to have that done i think it's nice to keep those remote branches around for a while they can always be deleted later but it's to me it's nice to have them still there and not go away immediately and when ready and then click the create pull request button and so it's a two-step process and the pull request is created and now in again still in the browser looking at the remote repository if we click on the pull requests uh, menu choice you get a list of pull requests and you can see that now there's a request for demo one to be merged into main if you click on that and this by the way at this point might be the project manager or it might be the developer if the developer has the rights to approve their own pull requests but you click on it and you get the opportunity to approve it and if you approve it and merge it then you get a confirmation dialog as the last step before merging which again uh, reflects the source and the destination the commit message is provided by the process you can alter it uh, enhance it if you need to uh, and finally you click the merge button and the merge happens and now the list of pull requests shows that one has been merged uh, into main so that's the end of the cycle on the right side of that figure eight diagram that i was referring to earlier if you look at the history of commits on the remote at this point you can see that the three commits that were part of that pull request have now been incorporated into main you can see this graphically that's the three dots red dots on the left that diverge and then are brought back into the main branch on the remote so that cycle is now complete and let's take a break here for a step back here for just a minute and reflect on what's happened uh, rick completed his work all of his changes are now in the main branch on the remote but alice and bob don't have them yet and for that matter rick doesn't have them yet either in this particular workflow Rick has not yet merged into main. So this is where there's a difference in this workflow than in the workflow for a solo developer. A solo developer using Git on their own would probably merge the development branch, demo one, on their local back into their local main because then they're going to build and release from there. So the question is, does Rick do that? And in this workflow, the answer is no. Again, this is not better or worse than any other. This is how this particular workflow works. Why not? Anybody remember rule one? What happens if Rick merges his local demo one into his local main at this point? Local main may or may not any longer reflect the production code. What if other developers have made changes on the remote main branch at that point? I'll get to you in a second. Um, there was a hand raised in the room here. And if other changes had been made, then his local remote would no longer reflect the production code. And so that's why you don't do that at this point. So in this workflow, not only do Alice and Bob pull from main on the remote, but Rick also does. And that may seem counterintuitive, but in fact, it works out fine. So the author pulls from main on the remote, just like any other developer. After that's done, then his local main is the same as the production main at that point in time. So how is that done? Well, this is how it's how it's done in source tree. First of all, the 
you got to check out the main branch. So whenever you're going to pull from the remote, you have to make sure you're pulling into the branch that you want to pull for, into on your local. So we check out the main branch, click the pull button on the toolbar. That brings up the dialog that you can see now. Probably best to, well, I don't want to highlight it. or I'm sorry, I don't want to make it bigger because there are going to be steps along the way. This confirms that we're pulling from origin. And again, just uh, shows you the remote link so you can confirm that that's the right one. We're going to pull from main into local main. And we're going to merge changes immediately. Those are options, but typically you're going to accept the defaults there. And then we're going to click the pull button and that'll pull back. And now this is the graphical history as seen on Rick's machine locally showing the the pull and the merge. And because the uh, show remote remote branches option was checked, I didn't mention that earlier, but there's a choice on the history to either show remote branches or not to show them. If you choose to show them, then you'll see them here. So origin slash demo one and demo one are the demo one branch and main and origin main are the local and the remote main branch. And then the commit message merged into demo one there at the top. So now we've completed that cycle. And Rick's ready to start again. And his main branch on his local is the same as main branch on the remote. Everything is hunky dory and we're ready to go. So I'll pause here again for a question or two. Uh, yes, there's a hand in the room. Um, I've got a GitHub pull request for the browser. Very much like the Jeep John here. And I have the Jeep John that seems to be sort of outside of here. But then anytime I push the get, okay, there's a button to create a pull request that seems to be good in here. I'm afraid to push that button because I don't know what it does. <laughs> <laughs> the question related the question related to GitHub uh, and a button that appears to create a pull request every time you do a commit, is that right? And uh, what I would say there is only that conceptually all of the services are similar in the sense that they support pull requests and merging and pushing and pulling but the interface is going to be different i i can't speak directly to what you're talking about here in github other than that uh, i would presume if you're not ready to create a pull request don't push that button <laughs> yeah um, really just takes you to the opens of your browser and takes you to the pull request page and fills a bunch of stuff in but doesn't actually click the create pull request button so there's still that you know you can still choose to create click that create pull request button in the browser or not so it's really all that you take you to the page to fill so doug doug's comment here was that there's a there's a safety step involved that if you click on that pull request button, it takes you to the browser, fills in a bunch of information on the form, and gets ready to create a pull request, but there's another step involved if you want to do it, and you don't have to do it at that time. I'm going to stop the questions at this point, so we have time. I'll get back to your question at the end. Again, another little divergence into JIRA. Uh, in order to track what's been done, Rick would, at this point, move his project into the done status, and the project manager would move the rest of them into in progress because now they're ready to go. Uh, the nice thing about Jira, and I'm sure about tools, project management tools that other uh, hosting services provide, is that they create a communication um, path. In this case, email. Jira is pretty talkative. It creates a lot of emails. So whenever the status of a project changes or a new project is added, um, an email is generated. So uh, the other members, in this case, Alice and Bob, would be notified that their task had been moved into in progress if they hadn't done so themselves. That doesn't mean there isn't communication between developers outside of this tool. It's just that it's facilitating communications by generating emails at this point. Well, we're about done. Uh, we've got some things to do still, but we've seen the process now. So now what happens is Alice and Bob need to do their work. So Alice does her job. She's assigned two desks, demo two and demo three. She pulls main from the remote. She creates her branches. She does her work. She commits. She pushes. Uh, 
in this case, conceptually, I'm, I'm looking at this as two separate pull requests, one for each of the tasks. And the pull requests get approved, they get merged, and now the history on the remote looks like this. Where you can see Alice's changes uh, diverging and then coming back together. And now all of her work is also in main on the remote. And the cycle for her is complete. Bob gets to work. He's assigned tasks four and five. So he pulls main from the remote. Now, whether he has Alice's changes or not depends on when he does his pull, right? If he pulls after Alice has Alice's changes have been merged, then he'll have everything. So it's kind of a standard practice in most workflows to pull from main if that's part of the workflow before you start work. Whether that's every day, whether it's more than once a day, depends on the nature of the team and the nature of the work, but it's best to always keep up to date. Sometimes if you're working on a feature branch, you might pull from main and merge main into your feature branch just to make sure you have all the latest <coughs> before you keep working. So that again, how often and when you pull <coughs> is a team decision based on how the workflow is constructed. In any case, Bob does his work. So he accomplishes tasks four and five, and he pushes his branches to the remote. He creates his pull requests. But now, simply by way of illustration, uh, during the review, it's discovered that one of his changes isn't quite ready for prime time yet. And so I wanted to show you the process as it exists in Bitbucket for uh, notifying that that has something else has to happen. By clicking on the pull request in Bitbucket, again, here we are on the browser. Whoever's doing the reviewer, uh, whoever is the reviewer, whoever's doing the reviewing in this case, uh, can enter a message in the message area. Not important what it says, but in this case saying, hey, you, you did part of this, but you didn't quite finish all of it, Bob. So we need to do more. And then we click the Request Changes button, and that generates a notification as well, and also changes the status to Changes Requested. So now Bob has more work to do before his change will actually get approved and merged. So just a little side note there as to how that proceeds. If you look at the commit history on the remote at this point, one of Bob's changes has been merged, but the other one has not. So then that, that looks like this. And you see the uh, Bob's changes on the top, but Notice that demo four has been merged. That's at the very top line. The second line from the top, which is his task number five, has not been merged. And you can see the uh, benefit now, perhaps, of including the task name in the commit message, because now it's really clear, looking down that entire list there, what task number was addressed in each of those commits. So that was that's because the developers have a standard guideline to include the task name in the commit message. On that second line, you'll also see off to the right that that commit is still on the demo fire branch on the remote. It has not yet been merged. That's also clear from the fact that the little dot representing where that commit is on the history, graphical history, is not yet been merged. It's just sitting there off to the side by itself. So we're about done. Um, if you look at the list of pull requests on the remote, you'll find that um, four of them are marked as merged. One of them is still marked as open. You notice at the top, there, uh, there's a drop-down list for which pull request do you want to see. The default is to show only the open ones. You can filter it to show only the merged ones. Or in this case, I chose to show all of them, which shows me both the merged and the open ones. There's also a denied uh, option, I think, and perhaps some others. So that's the way that everybody keeps up with what's happening on the remote. So here's you know, getting ready to summarize here. This is the beauty of 
collaboration using Git on a, on a central remote server, that each developer can follow that development cycle, that figure eight, if you will, on their individual and different, you know, local machines sharing the same remote repository. So Alice does her work, Bob does his work, Rick does his work, all of them share with each other via that remote repository. And in the end, keeping in sync with one another as the development process goes along. So we're done. Here's what we did today. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, three different hosting platforms, how they differ, what to look for when you're choosing one, and how to get started using them. And then, by way of example, and again, thank you for bearing with all the slides. I hope the animation helped a little bit to give you a sense of how the workflow progresses using SourceTree. Uh, we talked about local and, and remote branching strategies, how many branches to use, when to create them, long-lived versus short-lived branches. Uh, I demonstrated how to create and use pull requests and how they get merged back into production in this workflow on the main branch. A uh, little side trip into JIRA just by way of showing how you can use its Kanban feature to mark the progress of the tasks along the way so the team stays informed of one another. And throughout all of it, how to use source tree. Um, I began using source tree many years ago with Mercurial. Uh, before I used Git, I used Mercurial. Some of you know that because I did some presentations on it. Um, and source tree supported Mercurial. It no longer supports it. And I switched to Git when it became apparent that Git was going to prevail. Microsoft adopted Git for one thing. And of course, uh, Bitbucket continues to support Git. And therefore, I continue to use source tree. I personally like source tree a lot. I've looked at a couple of other GUIs. It's almost like workflows. Somebody is going to have another favorite GUI, whether it's Git Kraken or HGGit or whatever it is. Um, not HGGit, but you know, one of the provided. There's, there's a number of interfaces uh, for Git, and you can certainly choose whichever one you like the best. But I hope you like Source Tree. I find it very useful. Um, we're done. The white paper has been updated. Please look for V1.1 and the foot footer section of the white paper. If you don't see that, you don't have the latest, so go back and get it. Uh, please do fill out your evaluations. We do use them and review them and try and do a better job the next time around. Uh, my contact information is in the white paper. Not blogging much anymore, but um, certainly email or uh, on, well, can we still say Twitter? I don't know, on X. <laughs> and uh, I'll be here for another 15 minutes or so for in-room questions. And those of you who are attending remotely, please uh, jump over to the Q&A session as soon as I can get out of this and get back over to that session. So thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure being here. Seeing everybody again in person is, is wonderful. It's been great. So thanks again.